Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, good middle of the night, if you are where I am, uh, whatever. Uh, we're going to talk about blunt trauma to the neck here. So we'll just go over uh, an overall approach to trauma to the neck, which includes blunt or penetrating neck trauma. We'll talk about various types of injury that can occur with blunt injury or penetrating injury for that matter. Uh, and keep in mind that these are not exclusive, so you can have more than one of these. A cervical spinal injury, laryngotracheal or airway injury, esophageal injury, vascular injury, etc. Uh, and we'll kind of overall talk about this theme with blunt trauma that uh, you have a bigger diagnostic challenge. And that's something to be said because neck trauma is a diagnostic challenge in and of itself. But with blunt trauma, it's a little bit more difficult because with blunt trauma, the problem is that you have injury to a large portion of the neck. You struck a pole, you hit your steering wheel. You don't necessarily know where the injury is just looking at the patient. Whereas when the patient comes in with penetrating neck trauma, it's a little bit more apparent. Okay, well, there's a knife sticking in right here, or there's a knife wound right here. Uh, or there's a gunshot wound here and an exit wound there. It gives you a better idea of where the trauma might be and what you should be looking for. Uh, so with blunt trauma, the physical exam is going to be very, very, very important. And then uh, eventually you're going to need to get imaging uh, no matter what with blunt trauma to the neck. So we'll talk about that. So our initial approach to neck trauma, which includes both blunt and penetrating trauma, initially is going to be the airway. And that makes perfect sense. The airway is the first thing you're thinking of in any trauma patient, but even more so in the neck trauma patient. And if you feel your neck, you would figure out why. What's the most prominent thing that you feel? You feel your trachea. You feel your airway. And so any patient with neck trauma, the immediate thing that we are concerned of is airway compromise. And this should be, uh, this should, you, you should keep a very low uh, threshold or a high index of suspicion for airway compromise. So some things that are obvious with airway compromise would be hypoxia and strider, but things that are a little less apparent that might trip some people up on test questions would be things like neck distortion or a hematoma formation. And any of these really should be intubated immediately. Now, why the hematoma formation? You might have a patient who has a hematoma uh, that is talking to you and they're saturating fine, they're breathing fine, and they have no problems. If you have a hematoma, likely the problem is that you've got bleeding somewhere. And this is usually, because it's in the case of trauma, recent bleeding, and the bleeding is going to expand. And if that is the case, we don't want to wait until the airway is compromised. And so we'll generally just intubate these patients immediately instead of waiting for an emergency situation to come up. Blunt trauma is primarily going to be managed based on symptoms and the ever-important neck CT with contrast results, whereas penetrating trauma is going to be managed both off symptoms and the zone of injury. So we're more anatomically focused with penetrating trauma, while with blunt trauma, we're going to be a little bit more symptomatically uh, and imaging-based. Uh, so that's just my general observations. I'm going to give you a uh, what I think is a very, very, very good uh, uh, workup chart um, algorithm uh, to use. I think will serve you really well for the test and for clinical practice. And you'll see a lot of algorithms that can be used. I mean, this is a very, very complicated uh, topic in trauma surgery, so there's going to be lots of Different people have different ideas of how it should be worked up, but uh, the one I've got, I think, is the best. I didn't write it, by the way. Uh, okay, so what can be damaged? Well, the first thing that you're thinking of, since we're thinking of the airway, would be the larynx and the trachea. So the larynx is the upper part of the airway, uh, and it provides you with your voice. Uh, so think of things that affect your voice. Hoarseness, dysphonia, if you have a patient who's conscious, a lot of times they're going to be moaning or talking, asking for stuff, 
usually pain meds. And so hoarseness and dysphonia can be noted pretty easily. Edema is something that you're going to have to palpate for. Uh, and again, this is also something that is pretty easy to note. Uh, pain below the hyoid bone and crepitation over the thyroid cartilage. So you should know that thyroid bone, that's the hyoid bone is right above the thyroid cartilage, um, about one finger length above the, the superior portion of the thyroid cartilage, roughly, depending on the size of the patient. Uh, so if there's any pain below there, it points to a laryngeal injury and then crepitation over the thyroid cartilage. What is crepitation? It's kind of like that feeling of bubble wrap. Uh, over the skin. You know, that bubble wrap that comes in packages that you probably liked when you were a kid. I know I did. Okay, tracheal injury. So then here we've got a little bit more lower down in the airway. Uh, you can have a tension pneumothorax. You can have that same crepitation over the upper chest. Esophageal injury, I'll preface by saying esophageal injury is more common with the penetrating trauma to the neck, whereas with blunt trauma, not so much problems with the esophagus, just because the esophagus sits much deeper, uh, and so usually you'll see uh, injuries to the much more severe injuries to the larynx or trachea before you'll see anything wrong with the esophagus. So I'm not going to talk about these much here. Uh, vasculature, big problem. So expanding hematoma, problems with the pulses. So weak or absent pulse, a bruit or a thrill over the carotid artery. Symptoms consistent with a stroke. Why? If your carotid artery is injured, you basically have symptoms consistent with a stroke because you're not getting blood up to your brain properly. So this could be contralateral hemiparesis, loss of consciousness, etc. Any patient with loss of consciousness, you should be concerned for a cerebrovascular accident uh, or injury to the vasculature. Can't call it a, a real bona fide stroke. All right, uh, nerves. So the major concern nerve-wise is the cervical spine. And with blunt trauma, the cervical spine is uh, really our number one, con number two concern next to the airway. Uh, so other nerves that can be injured are cranial nerve 10. So this is your vagus nerve. You have voice abnormalities, vocal cord asymmetry if you're intubating the patient. Uh, cranial nerve 11, that's your spinal accessory nerve that innervates your sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscles, which are uh, nerves that, uh, or muscles that affect your shoulder and neck. So the sternocleidomastoid, when you're doing your neur neurological exam, the sternocleidomastoid is responsible for turning the neck laterally. So you won't be able to ask the patient to do that because most of these patients are going to have a C-spine collar. However, what you can do is ask them to shrug their shoulders. Uh, the trapezius is responsible for this. So if there's any injury to cranial nerve 11, likely that will be compromised. And then cranial nerve 12 is your hypoglossal nerve. That would cause tongue deviation, uh, I believe, towards, towards the affected side. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, phrenic nerve would cause asymmetry of the diaphragm. Typically, you'll see this not on chest x-ray, but on CT, because that's going to be the first exam you go to. Uh, use of accessory muscles of breathing, you may see that too, and that could also present with, uh, with shortness of breath or uh, dyspnea. So blunt trauma of the neck presents a greater diagnostic challenge than penetrating trauma, just because we don't, uh, on, onset, uh, on outset, know where the injury is just by looking at the patient. And so it's going to be very important to carefully consider the symptoms uh, but ultimately, you're going to get uh, a, a CT examination. Uh, the airway and cervical spine are the, in the greatest peril for blunt neck trauma. The esophagus is generally in less danger compared to with penetrating neck trauma. Just think of it, of it. If you have a knife stabbing into you, it's much easier to get at the esophagus, much easier to penetrate the esophagus than if you have blunt neck trauma. Uh, and furthermore, uh, the the airway uh, is made of cartilage, and your cervical spine is made of bone, whereas your esophagus is made of soft tissue. Uh, and soft tissue typically is not injured with blunt trauma, but with penetrating trauma, it's very easy to damage something like the esophagus. So provided that the patient is stable, 
and that they have no signs of impending airway compromise. And by stable, I mean that they're hemodynamically stable, that their airway is stable, and that you've ruled out any other injuries that may cause instability. So you got a patient with blunt trauma of the neck. It's usually from a car accident. We got to rule out any other kind of bleeding or things that may cause emergency in the patient, like a hemopericardium or a lacerated spleen or something of that nature. So it's not, you, you've got to think of the patient as a, uh, a multi trauma patient. It's not just, we're talking about trauma of the neck here, but the patient as a whole could have injury somewhere else. So uh, provided that the patient is stable everywhere and has no signs of impending airway compromise, then the best initial diagnostic step for localizing where the problem is, uh, if there is any problem from blunt trauma of the neck, the best test is neck CT with contrast. And further tests can then be done after that to investigate for problems based on the CT findings or based on the symptoms. If the CT demonstrates vascular damage and the patient is symptomatic, especially neurologic symptoms, altered mental status, especially uh, things uh, like uh, uh, the contralateral hemiparesis, you're thinking of if you have injury to uh, the vessels going up to the brain, then the patient should be taken to the OR immediately. Uh, Otherwise, uh, you can do additional tests just based on the symptoms and on CT findings. So a uh, laryngeal injury, you can do a laryngoscopy, a tracheal injury, you can do a tracheoscopy, or you can just combine the two and do a laryngotracheoscopy. Uh, an esophageal injury, you can approach this one of two ways. Um, although typically blunt trauma of the neck, you don't have esophageal injuries, uh, you can uh, either do a gastrograph and esophagram or you can just go ahead and do an esophagoscopy. Uh, why do you use gastrographin if you're going to do an esophagram? Because if there is an injury to the esophagus, uh, what we're concerned of is like some kind of perforative injury. And if you have a perforative injury, remember, you don't want barium spilling out uh, into wherever the space is outside of the esophagus. So you'd use gastrographin. If there's vascular injury, but there's no neurologic signs, that will provide you with the time to do an angiography. And that helps the surgeon, the vascular surgeon, to plan surgery and know exactly where they're going to need to go to treat the patient. However, if they do have those neurologic symptoms, you're going to wheel them straight off to surgery. Any symptomatic patient should be admitted for follow-up tests and for observation by uh, the surgeon. So if the patient with blunt trauma of the neck has any symptoms whatsoever consistent with problems, even if their CT is negative, they need to be admitted and only discharged by a surgeon. They should not be discharged from the ED. All right, so we talked about C-spine injury, and C-spine injury is our number two biggest concern with blunt trauma of the neck. So how do you know when to take that cervical spinal collar off? Because you are going to be asked that. A patient usually gets their cervical spinal collar from the EMT, uh, and the patient usually doesn't like to have that uncomfortable collar on. And I myself, when I was a kid, had to have one of these on, and I can tell you I, these really are not comfortable, and they're kind of irritating. So uh, you will be asked to take these off, and it's you as the physician that needs to give the go-ahead. It can't be done by a nurse. Uh, so this is uh, going to be something very important for you to know how to do. So I like to think of this as four steps, all right? Uh, so the very first step is to make sure that you have a patient that can relate any problems to you. So alert and oriented. They're not... They don't have any drugs or alcohol. Mostly we're thinking of alcohol here, but no drugs or alcohol on their system. And that they have no head injury because that is a whole another can of worms that uh, we're going to have to think of uh, with making sure uh, that there's no upper spinal injury. Uh, usually they're going to need to get imaging. So uh, alert and oriented, no drugs or alcohol. Uh, you've got a patient that 
is competent to uh, tell you if there's any problems. So no head injury, no neck pain, no neurologic symptoms, and no distractions. By distractions, I mean there's no pain uh, that would make it difficult for them to tell you if they have neck pain. So if you were in a car accident and your hand got cut off, you're going to be in a lot of pain. And you may not be able to relate to the physician if you have mild pain in your neck because all your attention is going to be on the severe pain you have in your arm. So if there's any kind of distractive severe pain, you're going to want to leave the C-spine collar on. So here's our first two steps, right? We got a patient, a patient that can uh, is sober and alert to, to relate any problems to us, and then that they have no head injury, no neck pain, no neurologic symptoms, and no distractive pain. Once you've got that, you're going to go ahead with step three, the neck exam. So the neck exam is going to be to look for any swelling, palpate for any edema, look for any bruises. Uh, if, there's, if, if the uh, neck is visibly and uh, palpably normal, then you're going to take the C-spine collar off temporarily. What you're going to have the patient do then is to move their neck in all directions. So a full range of motion, and it should be painless. And then you're also going to palpate their cervical spine, their entire cervical spine. As long as there's no swelling, no edema, no bruising, they've got painless, full active range of motion, and there's no pain to palpation of the spines, you can remove the C-spine collar. All right? So we'll just do this one more time because it's so important. So step one, make sure you've got a sober and uh, alert patient who can relate pain to you. So you can probably include that no distractions uh, along with these first two. So alert and oriented, no drugs or alcohol, no distractions. Step two, make sure they've got no head injury, no neck pain, no neurologic symptoms. Once you've done that, we'll go in and look at the neck. No swelling, no edema, no bruising, good. Step four, we'll remove their C-spine collar and check to see if they've got painless full active range of motion, which is good, uh, and no pain to palpation of the spines. And if all of this is okay, you can clear the C-spine. All right, that's a lot to remember, but usually it's pretty fast to do this. Okay, so here's our algorithm for uh, blunt neck trauma. So initially the patient comes in, we're taking care of our ABCs, careful airway analysis, intubation if needed, C-spine immobilization. Typically these patients are already immobilized because the EMT has already done this. Once we've done that, made sure that the patient is stable. Then we do the next CT with contrast. Uh, laryngeal or tracheal injury, uh, if that's there, then you can do laryngoscopy or tracheoscopy. If that's positive, then uh, you should get an ENT consult or they should be sent off to the OR. If you have an esophageal injury that's suspected, you can do a gastrographic esophagram or esophagoscopy. If that's positive, send, send them to the OR. If you have a vascular injury suspected on the CT, then the question is, do they have neurosymptoms? If they don't have neurosymptoms, they have time for an angiography. Get the angiography. If it's positive, send them to the OR. If they do have neurosymptoms, they're, they're going to be sent to the OR immediately. No time for angiography. And if there is a C-spine injury, which usually you'll be able to see this from the, from the CT scan, uh, then you're going to get a cervical MRI. That's going to give you a better idea of where and what's injured, uh, and then you'll get a neurosurgery consult. Right. If you have any questions, let me know.